Okay. Well, welcome everybody to this uh, cardiac valve seminar. And we have a great pleasure today to have a guest from, I don't know, Italy or New York or both. But uh, she's been jet setting the Atlantic. And um, Sylvia a priori is, uh, really doesn't need an introduction here, but uh, it's uh, enough to say that she's been really instrumental to our, our understanding of the genetic basis of cardiac arrhythmias and has done uh, seminal work on the Longitude syndrome, Bogata syndrome, and also more recently on CPVT, catecholaminergic uh, polymorphic ventricular cardios. And all of those have really taught us a big lesson in the mechanisms of cardiac arrhythmias and how they're related to molecular biology of cardiac cells. So I think for that, we're all very grateful to Sylvia. And also she provides a fantastic example how you can bridge the gap between the basic science really and truly from cell to bedside. She's bridging that gap. She's also bridging the gap from uh, Italy to New York. So with all of that, Sylvia, you're welcome. Oh, I forgot to say that it's a homecoming for her because she did her foster. Feel the core. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yoram, and it's a very special pleasure for me to be here. In fact, I'm a bit more nervous than usually because it's really coming back home after many years. I was here exactly 20 years ago, and some of the people were here at the time I was training, so it's really a special occasion, and I thank you all for the invitation. So the understanding of cardiac repolarization through the study of genetic diseases has really been an adventure that started with the seminal work of Mark Kidney, who dedicated a part of his career to the discussion of the molecular substrate of one disease called the long QT syndrome that turned out to be a disease in which ion channels are genetically modified. And that concept uh, that highlighted uh, the importance of even a minor change in the structure of an ion channel uh, in order to elicit uh, arrhythmias that are life-threatening and cause sudden death in young children really stimulated a lot of other investigations trying to dissect the molecular basis of other conditions that were known to be clustered in families or genetically transmitted. And I think that this has started something that has been going on between the patient, the understanding of the genetic substrate, the study of the mutation, the study of the arrhythmias and the link between a mutation and the phenotype, and that all this has contributed to the understanding of molecular basis of cardiac arrhythmias beyond the primary diseases. So now the field of the study of the molecular counterpart of cardiac arrhythmias is trying to make the next jump and to reach the understanding of the predestination, predisposition of individuals to develop any forms of arrhythmias and not only the one in which there is a monogenic component, a monogenic disease. So we are going from the understanding of how one mutation that per se is enough to cause the disease, how common variations in the DNA may also modify the stability of the heart and the electricity. So when uh, Mark Keating started his work, the understanding was that mutations in ion channels like the sodium channel and some of the potassium channels, so all the channels located on the membrane of the cardiac myocyte and mainly modulated by the voltage changes in the membrane were the substrate of the arrhythmias. Now with uh, a big expansion in the field and the identification of many forms of these uh, uh, diseases, we have understood that many different ion channels uh, are responsible for cardiac arrhythmias, for genetic cardiac arrhythmias, but also, and I think that is conceptually very interesting, 
proteins that regulate the trafficking of the of this protein, the location of this protein in the cell membrane, such as caveolin or ankyrin, are also or syntrophin are also responsible for these conditions. And definitely, for some of these proteins, like uh, GPD1L, for example, or Yotiao, you know, we still lack a lot of the basic functional understanding of what the role of these uh, protein is in the heart. So even if we know that mutation in some of these proteins that per se are not iron channel causes clinical diseases that uh, are characterized by arrhythmias, with the fact that we still don't have a complete understanding of the mechanism by which this mutation causes the phenotype uh, is very interesting and stimulating and still ready to be completely dissected and understood from the basic science point of view. Another set of protein that uh, is important for the implica heavily implicated in these uh, genetic diseases are the calcium controlling proteins. Uh, the voltage dependent calcium channel, the rionidin receptor, and cardiac calcium So this is a set of diseases that has in common the misregulation of the machinery that regulates intracellular calcium. And therefore, it's been interesting to see how mechanisms underlying this set of diseases have some analogy with uh, arrhythmogenesis in heart failure, where we know that abnormalities in calcium handling is implicated. So I would like to sort of provide you an overview, not much on the classic understanding what is modified in each disease, but maybe more of uh, which are the things that are being dissected now and which are the things that we don't understand yet about these diseases. So when we look at conditions like the long QT syndrome, the short QT syndrome, or Brugada syndrome, all these diseases have in common the fact that are mainly the protein, the, uh, the alternate protein are mainly coding for subunits of cardiac ion channel. And basically, we could see that if we take the shape of the action potential in this very classic slide and we correlate it with uh, which current uh, inward in green or outward in red is, uh, sorry, the opposite, <laughs> is, is activated at each given time, uh, we can clearly uh, understand that, that we have basically one genetic condition for each of these ion channels and even more we have subforms of this condition for each subunit of that forms the ion channel that is implicated. So the picture is quite complicated because the clinician immediately says, if we have a long QT syndrome that is associated with mutations in the channel, in the alpha subunit of the channel conducting the IKS, and mutation in the alpha subunit of the channel that conducts the IKR, is this the same disease or actually these are different diseases? I mean, the classification that the clinicians have made based on the electrocardiogram, now that we have the genetic substrate, is this still holding true or not? And interestingly, the answer is no, or maybe partially yes, but definitely once you know which is the molecular substrate, you can understand the clinical phenotype much better. So I think that has been really fascinating for uh, basic scientists to understand that their contribution in understanding the basis of the arrhythmias in these conditions really affects the way the clinician then handles their patients because each of them, depending on the subject, in, in strictly speaking, has a different disease. So now one other way of looking at the arrhythmias uh, with the genetic substrate rather than starting from the electrocardiogram or the symptom, can take the opposite approach, the basic scientist approach, and say we have conditions like diseases that can be called the IKS diseases, where there are mutations in the subunit of the channel that conduct this current, and these mutations may be either dominant or recessive in the, in the phenotype that they create, so you may ha have the need of having two mutations, either similar or different, in the same protein in order to have the phenotype, or is enough to have one. And then the other difference might be, is very different to the outcome if you have a loss of function and you have a long QT syndrome, either the dominant or in uh, uh, discontinued lines, the recessive form, or if you have a gain of function, actually you may have phenotypes like a familial atrial fibrillation 
or short QT syndrome. So even when you start from the channel, depending on the consequence of the mutation and how much you need to have in terms of mutation, it has to be all the protein mutated or only 50%, then you may result in very different clinical phenotype. And you may repeat this exercise for IKR diseases, INA diseases, and calcium diseases, and also the diseases related to the sarcoplasmic protein. So as you see, it's if you look in a perspective, it's quite uh, an amazing change that we have made, an advancement that we have made in the last 20 years from the marketing <coughs> identification of the first mutation in the KCNQ1 gene encoding for the alpha subunit of the channel that conducts the IKS, all the way in 20 years to be able to say that actually the type of uh, current that is modified can provide a specific phenotype that is a specific human disease. So I have mentioned to you this rough way of dividing the consequence of mutation in gain of function and loss of function. And the initial understanding was that we could really talk about gain of function mutation and loss of function mutation, saying if you have a loss of the potassium current, you prolong repolarization. If you have a gain of the potassium current, then you shorten repolarization. And that was a very simple way of uh, this, of Providing the consequences of mutation found, for example, in people resuscitated from cardiac arrest in which the underlying disease was not understood. But lately, we have understood that this scheme is not so simple. In principle, it's correct, but that there is another order of complexity. And the reason why the field is moving, trying to dig and go beyond this, is that obviously the clinician had observed that it was not so obvious to see patients uh, having a gain or a loss of function, but that there actually there were patients showing electrocardiographic phenotypes that could not be quite attributed to one of the two categories of patients with manifestation, arrhythmic manifestation, that were not typical of long QT or short QT only, but they were sort of a mix, or they were not typically Brugada syndrome or long QT syndrome type three. So in fact, we have not taken into consideration in the study of the molecular genetics, the fact that there is an heterogeneous distribution, and here we are showing the heterogeneous distribution of one of the current, the ITO, that per se is not specifically linked yet to any disease, but it's just to give the example that for any ion channel, there are differences of distribution in the epi, in the M cells, in the endocardial cells, and that the same heterogeneity is present in different areas of the heart, like the atria and the ventricle. Just to give you an idea, for example, there are some arrhythmias caused by genetic defects in which the patient has a phenotype only at the ventricular level and not at the atrial level, or vice versa. And obviously, the mutation being genetically transmitted is present in all the cells. So obviously, even the specific mutation in one of these ion channels may be characterized by a predominant manifestation at the level of the atria of the ventricle. And it's still unclear whether that has to do with the specific biophysical consequences of that mutation or on other factors that actually determine what is the consequence of a specific mutation in one individual. And concept like uh, to which extent the abnormal allele is expressed, transcribed, and the protein produced uh, versus uh, situations in which only the healthy allele is preferentially expressed may have a major impact in the manifestation of these conditions. And actually, if you don't want to limit all the reasoning and the understanding only to the diseases in which there is a monogenic abnormality, we may also think that the same type of variation, preferential expression of one allele or a different quantity of protein produced, may also take place in normal individuals through the effect of their single nucleotide polymorphism. So why someone tend to have during heart failure cardiac arrest as opposed to decompensated heart failure and, uh, and died because of pump failure may be also accounted for by the heterogeneity that is downstream the genetic makeup of the heart of an individual. And this is just to show that the basic science studies that have highlighted the 
variability, heterogeneity of the expression level of the different ion channels in the ventricle are really very fundamental uh, observation to try to help people like us understand why, for example, in a family you may have two individuals with the same mutation that actually manifest very variable phenotypes. So at this time in which we have a large variety of mutation very well matched to the phenotype of the patient, it becomes very important to approach the entire field with different questions and develop different tools to actually try to use this very abused term of personalized medicine to go from having a mutation and knowing that the patient carries a mutation to get this type of information in our patients and try to understand how actually a given mutation is represented in the heart of an individual and if that corresponds to a more or less arrhythmogenic phenotype. This is a slide that shows that, in fact, uh, you know, whether you have uh, your distribution of an ion channel more in the FE, in the M cell, or in the endocardium may create a difference in the phenotype because the consequence of the same mutation as the work of uh, Yoram has clearly shown in collaboration with Colleen Clancy when they started developing this computer simulation of the mutation that patients present uh, and you can really determine which is uh, the clinical manifestation in the patient. One of the observations that we had made uh, and uh, that uh, highlighted early on the fact that we could not simply say now that we know that there is a genetic mutation and we can study that mutation in vitro is so clear and simple and immediately related to the phenotype that came from this uh, uh, very straightforward evaluation where we said once we express the mutation in these two channels and uh, we know which is the loss of current that we have in an heterologous system then we could probably correlate the loss of the current to the clinical phenotype uh, that is the QT in our patients. More the protein is abnormal and the more uh, dramatic is the consequence of the presence of the mutation, the more repolarization would prolong. At least this is what one would assume. But if you look at this uh, slide where we have uh, the residual potassium current uh, on this line and uh, the duration of the QT, you can really see that the mutation with a 20% residual current, dominant negative mutation, where the presence of the mutant also impairs the function of the healthy subunit, the subunit produced by the normal allele. Then you could have patients with a normal QT interval, amazing because you have such a dramatic reduction of the function of the channel in vitro, all the way to people with a major e prolongation of the QT interval. Obviously, if someone is able to have a normal QT interval, it means that there is some compensatory factor that actually is the most important one in determining the response to that specific mutation. We still do not have a lot of information on uh, why this happens, but there are individual patients that present a dramatic mutation like this mutation that is located like in the core or of the uh, KBLQT1 gene that is the channel that conducts the IKS. And actually this in this family we have the index case who has a normal QT and she presented with cardiac arrest only she was treated with very high dosages of uh, IKR blocking drugs. So in, the, in this case was cisapride a prokinetic drug uh, even for uh, stomach problems. And under, under those conditions, uh, her heart uh, could not tolerate the therapy, the QT markedly prolonged, and she went into ventricular fibrillation. These are the children that had the same type of profile. They carry the mutation, and they have an absolutely normal QT interval. So this information, uh, uh, this observation has been very important to lay the foundation of the concept that some paradoxical response to drugs, uh, for example, like the uh, development of torsadepoint with antihistamines, with a certain antibiotics, may be actually something that has a substrate, uh, the presence of a mutation. And Dan Roden has done very important work in this area 
it has been able to demonstrate that at least 10% of the patients with drug-induced torsadequin actually are silent carriers. They don't show a prolonged QT at rest, but they show a prolongation of repolarization that is much more accentuated than normal individuals when they are exposed to a, chan to, to a challenge. So definitely, I think it's amazing when we think uh, our assumption of the direct link between the amount of current and the phenotype to see that this mutation that I show you in the family where the mother had the cardiac arrest because of Caesar pride, how depressed is the function of the channel in vitro. Obviously, there are other factors that are compensating in that family the manifestation of the phenotype. And we are really at the infancy of the understanding of which could be factors that modulate the response to a primary mutation. And uh, obviously, one immediately will start thinking that there might be single <coughs> nucleotide polymorphisms or common genetic variation in the same protein, in the ion channels protein, that may actually interfere with the primary mutation. And in fact, some of the SNPs have been identified in the ion channels uh, that may modulate the response of the primary mutation. But uh, since uh, science always uh, has surprises, uh, it took a genome-wide association of studies to find the most important uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that modify <coughs> cardiac repolarization. And definitely, without taking the approach of screening all the SNPs uh, present uh, in the genome and placed on a, on, a, on a chip. I think that very few people would have guessed uh, and would have thought about nitric oxide synthase one adapter protein as a candidate for being a very powerful modifier of repolarization. There is still a lot of basic science study. This observation was made uh, by the John Hopkins group and Aravinda Chakravarti has been instrumental in uh, setting these studies together. And Gordon Tomazelli is uh, heavily involved uh, in now studying the uh, consequences, the functional consequences of this common variation of the nos one ap gene and actually how nos one ap that was not even considered as something as stressed in the ventricle could actually modulate the actual potential duration. And there are data that suggest that the effect may be played uh, through the calcium and potassium current. But the importance of this type of studies is not only because these things may modulate uh, the phenotype uh, in the patient with long QT syndrome, but it's because when we go to the understanding of subtle modifiers of the predisposition to develop arrhythmias or the modulation of cardiac repolarization, we really enter the area of uh, the predisposition in the general population. So now at 48,000 individuals uh, overall in many different uh, population cohorts have been investigated uh, for their nos one ap uh, SNPs. Uh, and uh, all these SNPs, the most important of these SNPs uh, are located in a known coding region. Uh, so it's even more complicated to understand actually what their consequences on the regulation of repolarization. But the finding seems to be very consistent with uh, an increase of uh, repolarization of five, six, seven, eight, in the range between four and eight milliseconds for patient carrier of one or more of these single nucleotide polymorphisms. So one would be inclined to say, well, six, eight, millisecond is not a big deal, it's a tiny little incremental increase, but if you think about uh, the antihistamines and the drugs that have been removed from the mass market because they were causing excess uh, of torsadequent, actually the mean prolongation of the QT interval was exactly in that range. That means that even a small average prolongation in the population is something that may in fact account for an excess of cardiac arrest. This is a crowded slide, but it's just to show you how many different studies have been produced and have confirmed this increase between four and, uh, you know, we have uh, data of six, seven, and eight milliseconds uh, in the QT interval when the nose one ap manor allele is present. More recently, uh, other studies have uh, uh, try to move step forward and use a different panel of SNPs.
techniques uh, that modify cardiac repolarization to some extent. And what the, this data has produced uh, is the evidence that, of course, then you don't have <coughs> one SNP at a time. But since these are common variations present in 25, 30% of the population, you have actually a not small percentage of the population that will have more than one of these SNPs that may either prolong or shorten the repolarization. There is one of the SNPs in the KCNK2 gene uh, that actually shorten repolarization. So they have created this uh, line that really shows that more SNPs that prolong repolarization that you have, of course, there is an additive effect. And so that really individuals may be exposed to higher risk. Right now, the study is not going to the demonstration that when you have more sleep that modify repolarization, you have more cardiac events. But it's shown that the QT prolongs in an additive fashion when you have more than one sleep. So starting from our interest in the monogenic diseases, now we are studying which sleeps and to which extent the sleeps can help us understanding the variation in the clinical manifestations in our patients when we have in our uh, Italian registry these large families in which with the same primary mutations patient may have pronounced or a less pronounced QT prolongation. And the investigation of the of uh, these, uh, we call it 366 because the numbers for the SNPs are too long, so the 366 SNPs in the nose one ap gene turns out to be a very important one to modulate not only the duration of the QT, but really the cardiac events uh, in the population of patients with long QT syndrome. So I think that this is the first demonstration that with the presence of SNPs, you can actually modify the and increase the risk of, of patients of having cardiac arrest and cardiac events. And therefore, <coughs> right now, we have gone from managing patients with long QT syndrome purely on the clinical basis, measure the QT and decide the risk. That was the approach in the free genetic era, era. Then we have moved to the monogenetic era where we were saying, but if you put in your multivariate analysis also the, pre the presence of a primary mutation and the gene in which this primary mutation is present, you can target the use of the defibrillator to patients with highest risk. And now we have included in the multivariate analysis also the presence of the minor allele of the nose one ap that can interestingly play a role in identifying the highest risk patients in the group of the individuals in which the QT at baseline is not excessively prolonged. So it fines tune our risk stratification schemes. So this just to give you an idea of how you know the field is really progressing both for the acquired diseases and for the monogenic diseases in the area of trying to learn and understand which it could be the role of these common variations. The problem with common variation, you've probably seen and read the uh, articles in the New York Times that really raised a lot of concern that maybe GWAS analysis uh, is not really identifying something very, very important. Uh, um, I think that it's very complicated uh, to take information from the genome-wide and bring them in the clinic. It's probably easier in the patients with monogenic diseases because they have one single abnormality that is very narrow and confined, and on top of that abnormality, the SNPs can modulate. It's much more complicated in patients with heart failure, for example, where you can envision that the variability, the clinical heterogeneity has to do with a lot of things that are happening at the same time touching a different variety of proteins. So I think that once more, we need more powerful mathematical approach to handle all this information and being able to put in multivariate analysis, not the classical uh, approach that we are using at the clinical level where we have five or six different variables. But when we enter in the analysis of the SNP, the SNP-SNP interaction is what is complicating a lot the interpretation of the findings. But I think, and other uh, obviously think and support the concept that we will come to a point in which we will have set of SNPs uh, that will be central in determining the susceptibility to cardiac arrhythmia. So, the, yes. So, where is that SNP located? That particular SNP? Sorry, try to go back. This specific SNP. 
SNP is in the C prime, C, in the five un prime untranslated region of the nose one in PG. So do you have any idea what, what it does to the function or expression of the channel or? That, that what I was saying, you know, is something that is being investigated mainly by the group of Gordon Tomazelli. They are also making knock-in and knock-out mice with the nose one AP. From what they have reported so far, there seems to be an interaction with the expression of the calcium current, the calcium channel. And this is uh, what, the, what they have observed. It's not clear yet if it's something played through the ENOS function and the, and that pathway of whether is a completely new pathway of, uh, of expression of the regulation that it is the one in which <coughs> not one it is implicated. And I think that actually the big contribution that genome-wide studies are giving is beyond the fact that they maybe increase the hazard ratio for whatever event by 0.5%, uh, but is more the fact that they actually point to pathway that are completely new and uh, are, it's like linkage analysis when you narrow down the, the linkage <coughs> analysis like the GPDL1 gene that has been associated with Brugada syndrome is the same thing it's still a gene whose function is not understood there are these data that suggest that maybe it reduces the density of the sodium current but the entire pathway the data have not been confirmed by all the investigators and the pathway is still not clearly understood so I think that there is still a lot of work uh, that has to be completed on this. But one thing I know for sure that, and I'm definitely convinced that 48,000 patients in at least uh, 15 independent cohorts of patients coming from large studies like the framing of the Rotterdam study, the CORA population, is really, you know, usually in GWAS, uh, you need to have one replication cohort. I think that these investigators have really found at least 50 replication cohorts. So I think that this is solid enough to really warrant some clarification, but I, I guess that we have robust evidence to support the, the existence. And how about the other genes, the SNPs on the other genes? Do they modify, um, you know, the QT to approximately the same small level of just four seconds? And, and you know, what, is it that This is an interesting point. In fact, uh, especially this, uh, the 366, uh, it seems that in the nose one ap one effect is mediated through the QT prolongation, and one effect is mediated on increasing the number of cardiac events, cardiac arrest and cardiac arrhythmias, independently from the QT. So in fact, there are two pathways to this effect, and probably is more powerful because there are two components. What is the, con the the reason why you have that is not clear, but uh, there is a study in the we clearly see here in the long QT patient that is independent from the duration of the QT. So even if you adjust for the QT, it remains an effect. And then also in the in one of the studies in the non-monogenic disease population published in Circulation, they've been able to show that there are two independent effects. Okay, um, here I would like to touch again on the heterogeneous phenotypes and uh, now leaving the potassium channels and the long QT and going more into this, uh, uh, the, the potassium related long QT in the function of the cardiac sodium channel that has proven to be another uh, very fascinating uh, protein in terms of uh, how the, the genetic defects uh, may actually create a large variety of phenotypes. So initially, the SCN5A gene encoded for the alpha subunit of the sodium channel was associated with the long QT3 prolongation of QT interval cardiac arrhythmias that at variance with the other forms of long QT syndrome tend to occur mainly at rest uh, and therefore at slow heart rate. Then again, the, the, the scheme gain of function, loss of function, Loss of function mutation initially were associated with the Brugada syndrome, that is, short repolarization and predisposition to ventricular fibrillation, again occurring at night. So interesting, both gain and loss of function tend to have cardiac events occurring mainly during sleep. But 
But then other <coughs> observations uh, were um, brought to attention that cardiac conduction diseases is also a phenotype observed in some of the patients uh, who ha carry loss of function mutation in the SCN58. And then there is also a report of uh, homozygous loss of function mutation in the SCN58 leading to six sinus syndrome. So even if one could say, okay, I understand four different phenotypes, one gain of function, three loss of function, there might be something specific in the gain of function and loss of function uh, uh, clustering of phenotypical manifestation. But what is more remarkable is that families have been identified with mixed phenotype, actually with, with individuals having a phenotype that is more an LGT, other is more a Brugada, and other patients really have a mixture of uh, all these conditions. So how mutation in this uh, gene and in this protein could be associated with different clinical manifestation is something that uh, as a uh, stimulated the generation of different hypotheses. So initially, uh, people were trying to collect the mutation and see in the distribution on the protein whether they would cluster more in the amino or the, or the carboxy terminal part of the gene, more in the uh, extracellular or the intracellular, more in the transmembrane domain, but nothing really, if you look at the distribution of the colors, nothing really makes a lot of sense in associating a position or a region of the, of the gene to a given phenotype. Also, when you try to look at the adjacent mutation, you can see that here between 1500, 1501, and 1502, you can really have any of the diseases. So functionally speaking, on one side it's amazing to see that one single nucleotide change <coughs> at a given position so close one to the other can actually modify so markedly the phenotype to really prolong the QT or really to shorten the QT or to give the Brugada syndrome or actually to generate an abnormality that is present only in the specialized tissue like in the progressive conduction diseases where you have PR and bundle branch block uh, uh, phenotype. But even within a single family, as I mentioned at the beginning, the variability of phenotype is present. We really had troubles in deciding how to manage this family, which initially we thought we were dealing with the family with long QT syndrome when the first child came to the attention for syncopal episode occurring at rest. And then we saw another member of the family, you see generation level four, so this is one of the cousins of the proban coming <coughs> with the Brugada syndrome. And then we said maybe there is something else besides this primary mutation. And then we characterized uh, all the individuals in this family and we actually saw that they had all the possible different uh, uh, phenotypes. And then we asked uh, Gus Grant to help us understanding the manifestation of this mutation that was, yes, informative on one side, but not really informative on the other side, because yes, you could say that if you have different changes, maybe you have a reduction of the peak current, but then you have a sustained current <coughs> combined in the mutation, then you say, okay, I have two mechanisms coexisting, but why was puzzled, still puzzles me a lot, as I'm, I'm still following this family, and uh, basically implanted the RCD in the couple of individuals who have had a syncopal episode. We didn't give any drugs because obviously it seems that the chances <coughs> of doing more harm than good is, is present there. And incredibly, they have not had any cardiac arrest and any shock of the ICD, so maybe we should have not touched them <laughs> at all. <laughs> but there are six sudden deaths in the family already, so I think that the one we have protected, we had a good reason for protecting them. But what I'm saying is that you know you still have, uh, irrespective whether the mutation causes something that may be seen as a reduction of current and something that is a gain of current as well, but why this person manifests predominantly the gain of function and this person manifests predominantly the loss of function, it was remains uh, the area that really deserves some investigation. And really, this should be investigation at the individual level on the patient. So. I think that it will take a next advancement and the next step in being able to understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the, the molecular phenotype? Is that 
mutation? The mutation is a deletion of uh, lysine at position 1500. What, what is the functional consequence for the channel? Okay, the, I, I don't have the expression, but what you see is the reduction of the peak current, so maybe trafficking abnormalities type of, of thing, and then a sustained current. Yeah. So there is a double. There are the two right things. Now. But still what I'm saying, uh, sorry, maybe I should have brought the, the, the current recording. What it doesn't make so much sense is why in this patient is only one thing that is manifesting on the ACG and the opposite. Yes. But it does make sense if you tell us that there's a double phenotype in the channel, then it all depends on the modifiers maybe as to which one yeah. predominates. So it can take it one way or the other, which is a plus. Yeah, but the, the, the point is really that we thought, seen from the perspective of someone who was seeing this patient 20 years ago when genetics was not in the picture, then we thought that these were really monogenic diseases. And now, you know, we, we still say that they are monogenic diseases, but we don't think that they are monogenic diseases. And there are obviously other things, and, and we are only looking at the consequence in one channel. But then if you start taking the picture, the NOS1EP and all the other pathway that we are still not controlling, obviously is a multi-dimension. We like to simplify things, but it's definitely multi-dimensional. Have you taken this family and looked at your panel, the panel of, of modifiers from the GWAS study to see where each individual sits in terms of numbers of <coughs> relevant alleles? We have not done a GWAS size. Uh, no, of you don't have to do the whole lot. But just we have done system. like six or seven uh, with uh, with Gus Grant. You know, when, when we saw that, we, we saw the uh, we were excited, and we didn't find anything, of course. <laughs> but we took a simplified <coughs> approach. We took the SNPs in the ion channel and the nos one ap and that didn't produce. But I, I think that is our, is the current narrow view of looking at these things. I, I'm not asking about the functional end, I'm just looking, I'm talking about the correlation the between the, yeah. the genotype. The, the genotype correlation of the SNPs <coughs> pattern with the L phenotype. Like saying all the patients with the long QT have these SNPs and all the yeah. one with the Brugada have these other. Well, they have, they have 12 of the, of the wrong SNPs and the Brugadas have 12 of the right SNPs. Yeah. For the number of SNPs that we look at, like 30, you know, we have not been able to make sense out of that. Okay. Okay, this is another interesting mutation that we have identified and this came from a sad but uh, interesting, this is published now, I have not updated this in circulation. Um, this mutation was identified in a child. They called us from Portugal saying that there was this baby with uh, long QT syndrome. Not, not, not a major problem, nothing special. They send us the ACG, we see a very long QT, we say, okay, it sounds like an LQT3 type of kid, so we will do the genetic. We find this mutation, we tell them that we have the mutation, and that the contact is not so good, so you know we don't know any other things. There are some of these genotyping we do as a service to so all we know is that two years later we get this phone call where the child had a syncopal episode and they had given him exilatin because uh, the mutation was actually on the sodium channel. And the child started having storms, worsening much more the phenotype rather than improving the phenotype and the clinical manifestation. Eventually the child died before you know, anything else could be tried. So we got uh, interested in this mutation, and what we were able to see in this mutation is that unexpectedly, <coughs> for an LQT3 mutation, the current density was reduced, suggesting a lot of function rather than a gain of function. We also saw that this mutation, I, I showed this one, but it's like the other one, this mutation has an incredibly large sustained current. We have the delta KPQ here. You know, this is the delta KPQ that usually when you look at the charts of a patient with the delta KPQ, you think you have a big sustained current. This is much, much bigger. So actually, what it turned out is that in this patient, what happens is that there is a decrease in the trafficking of the channel that is probably what makes this child to be alive despite this sustained current. The minute they gave mexility, thinking of blocking the sodium channel are reducing. What happened, the mutations start trafficking more because the mixilatin in a lot of the 
trafficking the effective mutant of the SPN5A actually increases the trafficking, just like Craig Jenner has shown that the blockers uh, of Herg actually increase the trafficking. I don't, we don't, nobody understands so far why. So what happened is when they gave the drug to the patient, mexilatin increased the trafficking, and this what led to the marked QT, paradoxical QT prolongation, and probably the arrhythmic storm. So, you know, this is just to say that uh, even when we take clinical decision, and I say that most mainly if there are clinicians uh, in, in the audience, when we take clinical decision in these patients based on the assumption that we understand the molecular substrate, you know, we should really be sure that we understand the molecular substrate <coughs> of the individual patient, or we may end up uh, really creating more problems than you. So, what, was it a sort of rebound effect of the mexilatine? Was there an initial apparent recovery by blocking the channel and then it was hours, days or something later? That I, I don't have an exactly time frame because obviously the clinician in the CCU with the sick child, they were not taking consistently all these uh, um, traces at even the regular time point. But, but they were trying to correct for a long QT or, or a rhythm? They were trying to correct for a long QT shortening with mexility, you know, and there are data showing that Mexilatin yeah. actually blocks and shorten the QT. So they were saying long QT3, we give yeah. mexilatin because the child fainted and we give mexilatin and we protect the child. So initially it should have worked, I, I guess. I don't, I, I, they were in, in the acute phase and they give, uh, what I know is that they gave mexilatin, it prolonged, they withdraw mexilatin, they gave flecanide and it prolonged if possible even farther till the child went into 221 block and then, you know, clinically it makes it become more complicated because you have bradycardia on top of that. What, when we studied in vitro all this, you know, we were able to show that both mexilatin and flecanide improved the traffic in, in the in the hex cells of the mutant and from there, you know, we sort of figure out what could have happened in, in this patient. So in this, in this patient before storm, we can see the there was a QT in the 500, 520, it with the typical longest T, no, without mexilatin. Yeah, and the then we, mexilatin became more 600. So they saw a prolongation. Yeah, the and the arrhythmic storm. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and then it became to one block. And <laughs> so, um, as, as I said at the beginning, it's not only the voltage-dependent ion channel that causes inherited arrhythmia, so there are other settings in which, uh, you know, we can take inspiration and information from these genetic diseases to actually understand how the ion channels work, and in this case, uh, how other channels or other proteins work. And I would like to say something about uh, these diseases associated with mutation of calcium controlling protein, and uh, the disease is called catecholaminergic polymorphic disease, just another of these syndromes in which, uh, especially this is a very pediatric uh, manifestation uh, type of disease, uh, usually eight years of age is the initial setting of, uh, of arrhythmic event. Again, the stress and the motion, just like in, long, in most of the long QT, trigger the arrhythmias in these patients. And uh, we identified that the ionidine receptor is the gene for the autosomal dominant form, and Michael Eldar in Israel demonstrated that cardiac calcium sequestrin is uh, the cause for the autosomal receptor. So the ionidine receptor works uh, as a channel that regulates calcium release from the SR, and cardiac calcium sequestrin acts as a calcium buffer inside the cell. What this patient presented is this typical <coughs> arrhythmia that is a bidirectional arrhythmia. And uh, I think that from an electrophysiologic point of view is a very interesting and challenging arrhythmia because it's not irregularly polymorphic like arrhythmias that <coughs> show different morphology of the, of the QRS, but it's really an alternation of positive and negative, positive and negative, positive and negative with QRS. That is the pattern that was uh, known to typical of digitalis intoxication. And actually, <coughs> for, as a personal story, it was interesting because I thought about the rionidine receptor as a potential candidate for uh, this genetic disease because Kumel reported exactly the fact that this patient had 
this bidirectional VT similar to the one of the patient intoxicated with digitalis. So since digitalis gives arrhythmias through delayed after depolarization, it became logical to think about all the genes that map in the region to consider that the prionidine receptor could be one implicated. It's a very malignant disease with uh, at age 10, 30% of the patients already have cardiac symptoms. By age 40, the number goes up to 80%. And considering the population of patients we are following, uh, this is the most aggressive disease, the most malignant of all these inherited syndromes. So in the rionidine receptor, there are point mutations uh, and they alter the function leading to this specific arrhythmia which is the functional mechanism is still something that has not been completely <coughs> dissected. So I would like just to give you three of the leading hypotheses that comes from group who have been extensively studying the rionidine receptor in the context of CPVT, but if before the link between CPVT and rionidine receptor in the context of heart failure. And this is where the genetic disease is now becoming something interesting as a model to study the rionidine receptor role in arrhythmogenesis. So this is the hypothesis that comes from Andy Marks, and Andy Marks has been focusing on the study of this protein called FKBP 12.6, more human name, Calstabin 2, which I will be using from now on. Calstabin 2 binds uh, to the portion of the rionidine receptor that is looking, facing in the uh, intracellular space. So this is the membrane of the SR. This is the inside of the SR. When the calstabin binds to the rionidine receptor, the channel is closed and uh, it dissociates, uh, it, sorry, and it dissociates uh, when the channel should leave the calcium out. When there is uh, an abnormality, when there is a phosphorylation of the of the of this uh, protein, the protein dissociates uh, and then the calcium can comes out. So the concept uh, that uh, Andy Marks uh, has proposed uh, is that uh, instead of having the normal function that the calstabin is uh, bound uh, to the receptor and maintain the channel closing diastole, in CPVT patient, what happens is that uh, the abnormal, the mutation present in the rionidine receptor makes more complicated for, more difficult for the calstabin to be bound to the rionidine receptor and keep it closed in diastole. And this hypothesis is very similar, actually it's identical in terms of the relationship with the calstabin and the rionidine receptor to the hypothesis that the same authors have uh, put forward for what happens during heart failure where they think that as a consequence of the uh, remodeling that occurs in patients with heart failure, the final pathway again is an un unbinding of the calstabin from the rionidine receptor. So their proposal is that the two conditions have uh, a different subset but a common final pathway that is the dissociation of calstabin from the rionidine receptor. Now what is interesting is that there is a compound that uh, uh, actually is an analog uh, derivative uh, of the calcium channel blocking agents. That is called JTV and now it's called uh, uh, K201, but anyhow is a molecule that has been developed in Japan that actually facilitates the binding of uh, calstabi to the rionidine receptor. So this is something that goes from a genetic disease, from heart failure, the understanding of the hypothesis of one of the pathogenetic mechanisms, and the proposal that one agent may provide a new way of treating arrhythmias in both conditions. So the field is now at the level in which uh, this, uh, a large pharmaceutical company has been interested in this area, so there are now advanced and modified uh, analogs of this compound that are being tested in different settings from mouse models of CPVT that we are testing all the way to a clinical trial being planned uh, as soon as the drug is approved for human use in the patient with CPVT as well parallel studies in patients with heart failure. Another hypothesis uh, to link the mutation in the cardiac rionity receptor has been advanced by Wayne Chen. What Wayne has uh, postulated is that the consequences of the mutation may not be much at the level
level of impairing the regulation of other protein of the rayonidine receptor, but rather to modify the threshold from the release of calcium from the SR. So he thinks that uh, what happens in uh, physiologic condition is that when you have sympathetic stimulation, you have an increase in the SR calcium load, and that gets closer to the threshold for calcium spillover from the SR. But not quite there to generate arrhythmias, because obviously if calcium is released during diastole, then it activates the exchange of calcium through the sodium calcium exchanger that, of course, is electrogenic, exchanging one calcium for three sodium, and that generates delayed after depolarization. So the hypothesis that Wayne uh, put forward for CPBT is that all the different mutations end up having one common consequence, that is to modify the threshold so that uh, the threshold is lower, and when you have the increase in SR calcium load during sympathetic stimulation, the, the increase in the calcium in the SR is enough to over, to exceed the threshold and start having calcium spillover leading to arrhythmias and uh, sudden cardiac death. And I'm uh, presenting you all different uh, uh, hypotheses because every author has tried to see the changes leading to one common abnormality, but what most likely happens is that different mutation cause more of one part of one act through one mechanism or through the other. And the final mechanism that uh, has been advanced is the one that Yano uh, from Japan has been uh, uh, working on, and uh, he thinks that what the mutation actually do is acting modifying the three-dimensional folding of the protein where there are these domains called zipping domain that actually allow a protein to fold in a given way because certain regions attract each other rather than uh, re refusing each other from a physical contact. So <coughs> the mutation modify the amino acid composition of that string of uh, protein that actually is supposed to stay close and the fact that these uh, tridimensional structure get changed destabilize the channel and allows calcium leakage. <coughs> A second paper by the same group now point to the fact that uh, this mechanism may be particularly active when there are mutations located in the central domain of the protein. And therefore, the leading concept now is that we may have in the catecholaminergic a situation in which cluster of mutation based on the physical localization in one region or the other may actually when have one or the other of the mechanisms as the predominant factor that destabilize the rayonidin receptor. All these hypotheses go at the end uh, anyhow to the fact that electrically speaking, if we just forget for a minute what is the molecular mechanism or the protein mechanism, but the electrical consequence is that calcium is released during diastole and therefore the mechanism should be triggered activity for these arrhythmias, which it would, you know, would make sense also from the analogy with the digitalis intoxication. This is one of our patients with bidirectional VT degenerating into VF that I think that uh, is fascinating how the bidirectional VT is a very stable rhythm. This patient can be for minutes in the directional VT, maybe with very modest uh, symptoms, and then in one beat it degenerates in a very disorganized VF uh, with, uh, that really required prompt resuscitation. We made a mouse model with the mutation that we identified in the first family in which we described rionidin receptor as the uh, gene abnormal in CPVT, and we were lucky to develop a mouse model that actually has the same phenotype as the patient with this bidirectional VT degenerating into VF. So I think that the, the fact that mice uh, with mutations in the rayonidin receptor have a phenotype that mimics so well the human phenotype has been quite instrumental and different groups have subsequently made our mice. So now there is a collection of mice uh, that are really becoming very useful to study new therapies and also to study the properties of these mutations. Nian Liu in, uh, in our lab, uh, you know, had the possibility of studying the myocytes from these mice and demonstrate, in fact, that triggered activity is present at rest. So there is some leakage already with the basal sympathetic stimulation that is uh, present uh, in, in the cells of the basic uh, uh, 
physiology of the reality receptor. But when you add that beta adrenergic stimulation, you're really able to elicit this trigger at rhythm. And if you block the rionine receptor, the baseline comes back and triggered activity is suppressed. When he also measured the calcium transient, he was able to show the classical uh, association between uh, after depolarization and uh, after contraction, showing that these oscillation of the voltage are parallel by oscillation in the calcium. But the clinician is particularly interested in understanding why the arrhythmia is bidirectional. And I think that a nice hypothesis on why the arrhythmia may be really bidirectional arrhythmia came from this study that Marina Cerrone did when she went to <coughs> from my group to join Pepe Alife. And they were able to do mapping studies of the mice. And they mapped the bidirectional ventricular tachycardia showing that the arrhythmias definitely originate from opposite sides of the heart. And their hypothesis, based on some studies that they did exposing the cells to Lugol that should selectively kill the Purkinje fibers as opposed to the muscle cell, they made the hypothesis that when on one side they give the caffeine and epinephrine, that is the catecholamine administration that elicits the bidirectional BT, but when they actually paint the endocardium on one side with Lugol, they transform the bidirectional VT in monomorphic VT, suggesting that there are two foci that are firing in their hypothesis from the Purkinje fibers that create this very stable rhythm. It still is a nice explanation. It still doesn't tell me <laughs> or doesn't explain uh, sufficiently why in all these patients <coughs> you get to a point in which this rhythmic, this alternation of foci comes from opposite sides of the heart and not maybe from two foci that are adjacent or at least on the same side. We have done some mapping of patients with catecholaminergic BT just to try to see if we could relate the genesis of the arrhythmias. And in human, it seems to be not so straightforward. You also don't have access to an open heart on the table to do exactly what you want in terms of the recording and be so um, accurate in the, in the recording. But definitely what we have seen is that uh, in uh, some of the patients, in, well, actually we have met three patients, so in two of the three of the patients, the bidirectional VT, different episodes of bidirectional VT originate from the outflow tract. Uh, and Therefore, you know, it's less straightforward to extrapolate this model. So it may be that in the mice it is strictly from the Purkinje fibers. From, for the electrophysiological point of view, there has been a debate that has gone on for years whether, you know, delayed after depolarizations may originate in ventricular muscle or they only originate from Purkinje fibers because they are cables and therefore it's easier to elicit uh, an activity that is rhythmic and fires uh, in a tissue that is not coupled like the, the myocardial syncytium. Interestingly, however, patients with CPVT, despite we always talk about the ventricular arrhythmias, they have a lot of uh, uh, atrial arrhythmias as well, and very often the atrial arrhythmias have an onset that precedes the onset of the ventricular arrhythmias. So that would suggest that probably even in coupled to myocardial tissue, delayed after depolarization may in fact elicit triggered activity because also the atrial arrhythmia show the same relationship that the faster the rate, shorter the coupling, and the faster pacing, the, the arrhythmia tend to get worse. So there are observations that are coming along in that uh, line. Beta block. Yes. Usually these patients are not candidates for an electrophysiologic study and because we have no real advantage mm -hmm. to propose to the patient. So it's very difficult to you know, find reasons to have the ethical mm -hmm. committee approved. Mm -hmm. you know, another thing that has been suggested has been to try to dissect the atria from the, disconnect the atria from the ventricle into the pacemaker trying to prevent the tachycardia in these patients. But that also is an appealing idea that I heard a, lot, a couple of times from audiences in which I have presented this, but we have never actually tried that. 
The beta blockers are not a great drug in these patients, are not a great drug in the mice uh, either. So we have been trying, uh, exploring other alternative uh, treatment for these patients. Very recently there has been an article suggesting that plecanide may be an effective treatment for these patients, at least in uh, uh, some of these mutations. The approach that we have taken in the mice that seems to be quite uh, effective and is the most powerful in preventing the arrhythmias is the use of KN93 that is an inhibitor of calmodulin kinase 2. And this, of course, opens a series of interesting observations on which uh, uh, Liu is working on, Dr. Liu is working on, and uh, again, he can show that uh, the triggered activity that is uh, provoked in these patients when you give uh, KN93 or uh, another peptide that inhibits uh, the calm kinase activity, you may reduce and block the trigger the uh, rhythm, and you can also block uh, the calcium transient. So this seems to be another interesting approach. So this is to show you another uh, part of the story that uh, all these basic science understanding besides pushing the field to explore not only what the common, the rare mutation do in the heart is pushing towards where the common variation do in the heart and therefore acquire cardiac arrest, and this is to show that uh, the molecular models in vitro and in vivo are actually trying to put forward new ideas, uh, new treatment for arrhythmia. So even if antiarrhythmic has been mainly a failure in uh, the management, in the prevention of cardiac arrest, there are new ideas that hopefully will be put to the clinical test. So just to conclude, uh, you know, I would like only to say that uh, it's been a very exciting and racing uh, uh, tour in these uh, 15 years uh, start trying to understand the molecular basis of arrhythmias. And the field uh, has attracted not only clinician and molecular geneticists as that at the beginning was the cluster of people involved in this type of studies of the genetic diseases, but it's really thanks to the interface with the basic science and the cellular EP and now more computer science and computer uh, modeling that the field has evolved so much. And I hope, uh, since I guess that most of you are basic scientists, I hope that I have uh, shown you that you don't have to leave this field very quick because there is still so much to do to benefit the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for this thought for walking and really fantastic presentation. By the way, nobody here is thinking about leaving the field. So <laughs> I just wanted to mention one, one more thing. It's even more complex because I think that you know you you cover the spatial heterogeneity, but there is also temporal heterogeneity, and loss of function and gain of function depends not only you know that you lose function or you gain function. This is true for trafficking and, and expression in the words. But if there are changes in the kinetics of the channel, it depends when the current is lost or gained during the action potential. There's a huge difference if it's early in the action potential. Sometimes even gain of function involves uh, change in the reversal potential at the top potentials that make the current inward instead of outward because of lack, lack of specificity. Filtering, you know, the filter is becoming non, non, um, non specific and allows sodium to go in in addition to potassium. So there's also the, all this complexity of the kinetics of the channels if they make it to the membrane and how they interact temporarily with the <coughs> another degree of heterogeneity, if you will. The other thing is that even in the same family, I would assume that different uh, people of the same, you know, the same, maybe with the same mutation, might have a very different baseline, but uh, the energy tone and hormonal makeup and all these uh, mutations operate on some background that is very different between individuals in the same family. And that's, you know, that, that's another degree. Yeah, th there are potentially many levels of complexity. I think that the challenge here is to try to identify which are the parameters that are key we can. to I make mean, some it's prediction. It's, yeah. If it's not completely stochastic and probabilistic, then it becomes... Part of it is human need to sort of classify things and put them in drawers, but maybe it's not so, maybe it's not so possible. Well, I think that in arrhythmias, so far, the reality has been that you cannot predict. 
like sudden cardiac death occurs at one point. Why? Because. For example, in your in your bidirectional thing, why at a certain point? It, it degenerates. The interest in your bidirectional type of cardiac death too is that in, in the map that you showed coming from two opposite sides of the heart doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? That was that's not your data, though, right? You know what? It, it doesn't make a lot of sense if they're coming from two sides of the heart from Purkinje tissue. They should be out of phase, right? I mean, they shouldn't be. Uh, so what, obviously, in the bidirectional type of current, yeah, the, 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 the second event is related to the first event. Now, an infarction, I've mapped it, and, and I can show bidirectional type of current is coming out of an infarction in different direction. The direction is locked one time, coming out the other side the next time. That's because they're dependent. Yes, because they're dependent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this cannot be Close, spatially close to one to the other. Okay, so what I'm saying is if they're independent, which should be so No, that, that no, no, is no. what I said that, you know, the study points. It leaves something that is not satisfying. But that's why she brought it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I thought of, yes. Yeah. So I think that it's interesting to think that, yes, the electrocardiogram is telling us that they are coming from distant side and maybe this distant side. Uh, correspond to certain structure in the heart that is the Purkinje fiber. But how they synchronize and how they get out of phase uh, all of a sudden with another beat, and then after that everything is irregular, it's really not clear. Uh, you're on, I think I've <laughs> asked you before this question. But <laughs> you know, Pepe says that you know there are these uh, synchronization of rhythm uh, that creates uh, some oscillators, and then he starts going mathematics, and he can tell me whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Does it make sense I, to you? It, it makes sense, but I don't, you know, you can show synchronized oscillators, but I don't know that this is the mechanism of this. Uh, I think uh, John is correct in saying that if it's so regular, then you know the upbeat has to be related to the downbeat. Otherwise, it will never be synchronized. So if you have two independent foci. Short answer, yeah. <laughs> Which is strange in a sense that no, not more of these bidirectional BT have been mapped, considering that yeah. you know they were maybe they were frequent in the clinics at a time in which mapping was not available. Well, maybe with some of our non-invasive methods. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay, then thank you again.